thank you all for coming tonight. And tonight what we're wrestling with is a big question. The theme, uh, why the Bible is not the word of God, begs the question, who's God, which God, what is God, and who cares anyway? And perhaps in our discussion we will get into those particular questions. But as a starting point, um, again, wanted to point out that I'm grateful to Andrew and Valerie for being with us. All three of us come out of the same branch of Christianity. Um, and they are joining with me tonight to focus on this deeply spiritual question about authority. Who or what authors your life? That's what tonight is really about. That's what the question's really about. Each of us come from a narrow Christian tradition that has as its primary authority the Bible. Um, the Bible is a specific set of writings, and it held authority over our emotions and our actions. In other words, rather than our own intellect and our own experiences, rather than even trusting our own self, we each come from a story that told us to conform our experience and our intellect to certain revealed truths. And these truths were written in the Bible and, of course, interpreted by clergy. And each of us are alienated from that tradition. Each of us have taken a path out of that tradition. Each of us have found that such a way of life and that such a story didn't work for us. And it didn't answer our questions. It didn't help us mature. It didn't help us evolve. And so this forum, Why the Bible is Not the Word of God, is actually about authority. Who or what authors your life? Who or what helps guide you in your behaviors, your thoughts, your emotions, your attitudes, and your daily moments? And for some, authority is located in an ideology. For others, it's in a patriotism of some sort, or a loyalty that is given to a person, or an idea, or a tribe, or a tradition. Others locate authorities within themselves, but that simply begs the question, well, who are you? And what has shaped you into being who you are? None of us can get away from the question of what story has shaped us, what authority um, is there in our life that guides our emotions and our intellect. Now, historically, there has always been from the beginning a tension within Christianity. It's a tension about power and control. For some, Christianity is an inherited tradition. They don't really think much about it. Uh, it's a family and tribal tradition. They've been raised in it, and therefore it's true. For others, it's a mystical experience. And, it, and, and that mystical experience is made sense of through this big overall Christian story. And from the very beginning, there was a tension between those who were mystically and spiritually innovative and those who were rooted in the rituals that gave comfort and hope. But the tension leads to problems once you gather in community. For example, what happens even inside a family or a network or a team or, or any communal endeavor when disagreement inevitably pops up? Some disagreements are minor. And a group, particularly a small group, can process it all through consensus and dialogue. But as the group grows and the issues deepen, the glue that holds the group together calls out for a broker or an arbitrator um, who can adjudicate between factions. And traditionally, as you all know, in the family, this was who? The, the papa. Papa, traditionally. Uh, it was the papa. The papa was the presence of authority, of power, and control. And tribally, the papa became the chief, the king. Uh, the great secular experiment of America was to locate authority inside the law, in the Constitution. And that was a check and balance by the majority of those that the law and Constitution ruled. Today, and this is, I'm trying to make a connection here today, one of the problems that we're having in our society is that we're living in a time of shattered and shredded authority. The glue that held us together is coming undone. Now, as the church grew up, it also split into factions. The Orthodox branch located authority, God, if you will, inside the liturgy itself. And to this day, if you go and you worship inside an Orthodox church, you'll participate in almost the identical rituals that they participated in 1,800, 1,900 years ago. The Roman, because that's where God is. God is in the liturgy. You will experience God there. Heaven opens up and comes to earth there. The Roman Catholic Church 
as you know, seized the rule of interpretation, both of scripture and the faith, and they placed it into the hands of the Papa, the Pope, who then commissioned his priests, we call them Father, to be his representatives. And the presence of God became located in the Eucharistic sharing of bread and cup, which became a spiritual communion of consuming the literal body and blood of Christ, magically transferring his spirit into the believer. And all of this was under the authority of the Papa. Now the Protestant Reformation, which we all come from, the word Protestant means to protest, rebelled against these constraints. And they basically said every believer is his own Pope, his own Papa. And they have direct access to the presence of God. So truth, authority was inside the believer. But there was a problem. If everybody has access, how do you settle disagreements? The Protestant principle located the God's presence in the scriptural text itself. The Bible itself became the location of God. But you can already see the problem. Mark Driscoll of Mars, Dr Mars Hill reads the same Bible that I do, but with extremely different interpretations. As a matter of fact, I would say that we worship different gods. Um, even though we both develop our image of God out of the very same text. So it's kind of a mess, this authority question. It's not an easy one to unravel. But here, uh, and here is where everyone, Christian or not, religious or not, can fit into this conversation tonight. You all have the same identical problem. We as a nation have the same identical problem. Who are we as a people? What are the values that glue us together despite our differences? What authority, what authorities are we willing to submit to for the good of all? Essentially, what story are we telling ourselves that helps us all get along? And that to me is at the root of this question about the Bible being the word of God. And so I'm going to turn it over to Valerie, who will then turn it over to Andrew, and they're just going to offer some reflections. Um, these are unscripted. They know what I'm going to say. I don't know what they're saying. They and they don't know what they're going to say. I can see. I mean, can you show them your you notes, Andrew? Notes. <laughs> There's Andrew's notes. <laughs> 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 and then, um, um, and then we'll, we'll break up into a group, and then we'll come back. <laughs> you can have my notes. <laughs> Do you want me to talk here? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Can, can you all hear me? Yeah. All right. Um, this fall during the election cycle, we had a number of, of Republican candidates who had what I would describe as rape Tourette's, um, meaning they just couldn't help blurting horrible things about rape. And, and you know, that included our own candidate, John Coster, who mercifully um, lost the election probably because of that. Um, but one of the, you know, and one of the, the, the people who had that condition that I describe as rape Tourette's um, said, you know, basically, even if, even if, you know, rape is this horrible thing. If there's a pregnancy that comes out of it and a baby's born, that's something that God intended. It was Murdoch, I think, who, who said that. And, and I thought, you know, the reason they keep blurting horrible things about rape and the reason they get stuck in these awful media circuses is because they're, they're, they're trapped. By their, by their beliefs. There are certain kinds of fundamentalist beliefs that actually bind people. And so I decided to write an article about that. I write for a place called Alternet and the Huffington Post and some other places online. And um, so I, I set out to write an article that I titled What the Bible Says About Rape and Rape Babies. And I basically wanted to make the point that when people have this view that there is an interventionist God who, you know, kind of, who is um, m messing around with our affairs um, and who says, you know, like in the book of Isaiah, I created good and evil, that they end up stuck with these beliefs that if you kind of trap them in an interview, get uncovered, and then they look really awful because they actually are really awful. And um, as I was wrestling with that article, I realized something about the Bible that I'd never noticed before, which is that there is no place in the Bible that it says or implies 
that a woman's consent is needed or desired prior to sexual intercourse. Not the Old Testament, not the New Testament. There are other ways that female and male relationships change over the course of time in which the Bible was written and the, those texts were assembled. That is not one of them. Um, and in fact, if you look at the Bible, there are many ways and many kinds of relationships and reproductive strategies, if you will, that suggest that non-consensual sex is both sanctified, um, endorsed by the code of behavior that is kind of in place at the time, and that God then blesses non-consensual sex with um, boy babies who go on to kind of be, um, you know, patriarchs and such. Um, so, you know, an early example of that might be Rachel and Leah fighting over who's going to bear the most offspring. And then when they're having fertility problems and the mandrakes aren't work, roots aren't working too well, sending in their servants. Um, Sarah also, as you know, sends in Hagar. It never suggests that Hagar has a say in that. Right, um, and then of and then you know another example early on might be just the whole notion that fathers give their daughters in marriage. Um, one of the things that happens in the Old Testament, if you actually look closely at the Old Testament ethic governing male-female relationships, it's actually not a rights ethic. Like there are there are there is an ethic in the Old Testament law that governs inter relationships between men, and that tends to be. Um, an ethic that is a that is the kind of ethic that we think of today governing relationships between equals but the relationship governing females is is a property ethic actually so a female is property her role is to produce offspring of known origin if she gets raped the rapist can essentially buy her by paying her father 50 shekels and then he is obligated to keep her um, if a woman, on the other hand, ruins her economic value by voluntarily losing her virginity and becoming then of kind of questionable emotional status and questionable pregnancy status, she can be killed for it. So, there, so there's this standard, and 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 this, and again, that is a standard that it puts women into the same category that slaves are in, that livestock are in, and that children are in throughout um, most of the, the, the biblical texts. Uh, so I, I say that as an example of why the Bible can't be the word of God. And part of what happens when people engage in a process that I call bibliolatry, which means making an idol out of the biblical text itself, putting it on a pedestal, treating it as if it were not the struggling of our ancestors to understand what is good and what is real and how to live in moral community with each other. But when instead they put it on a, text, uh, on a pedestal and make it, the Bible itself, an idol, then it binds them to these Iron Age understandings of what it means to be male and female, what it means to be human, what it means to be good, and some very, very ugly things come out of that kind of idolatry. Uh, Rich mentioned Ma um, Mars Hill Church and Mark Driscoll. I was at Mars Hill a few years back prior to the Easter service, and Mark Driscoll was, who is a biblical literalist and stands, kind of has constructed a, a version of Christianity that stands or falls on that biblical literalism, said, if the resurrection didn't literally happen, there is no reason for us to be here. If the resurrection didn't literally happen, there are parties to be had. There are women to be had. There are guns to shoot. There are people to shoot. And at the time, feeling a little snarky about the whole thing, I thought to myself, well, you know, if the only thing standing between you and debauchery, lechery, and violence is your belief in the literal resurrection. I'm really, really glad you believe that. <laughs> um, 
I was irritated because, of course, I don't have to tell you in this room what he was implying about the rest of us. Um, but if you look at, think about what he said a little more seriously, part of what, what it, it conveys or what it reveals, perhaps inadvertently, is this sense that, that if you embrace this biblical literalism, this bibliolatry, this sense of the Bible itself as the word of God, then you don't have to come up with any deeper, harder, more um, fibrous, tougher, complex, and, and, and robust answer to the question of why we shouldn't be drunk and raping and killing each other. There are very good reasons, there are very good answers to those questions, but in the context of biblical literalism, you never get there. How much time do I have left? <laughs> okay. Um, I, when I was working on my book, Trusting Doubt, one of the things that I realized in thinking and wrestling with this question of biblical literalism is that, you know, Bibliolatry, I said, is the, is the worship of a book. It's actually the worship of a communications technology, the written text. And if you think about human history, there was a time when our best understanding of the world around us, our, our, our metaphoric, mythic, epic stories were handed down by oral tradition. In fact, much of what's in the Bible was originally handed down that way. But when things were handed down by oral tradition, they were free to evolve as, as human society evolved, as it became more complex, as technologies changed, as, as our understanding of ourselves and each other and the world around us deepened. Um, when, we, when we developed the written word, one of the things that happened actually is that allowed us in a sense to become developmentally arrested because the written word is static. And so it, it allows there to become a disconnect between people's understanding of what is true and what is sacred and, and the ongoing change in society and our interdependence and complexity which grows as technology changes and as people become more densely populated and so forth. And, and then when you have the canonization of texts, right, a set of texts, you not only have a given text that's static, you have a set of texts now that is static. So it says not only do we, is, is, is uh, you know, this fragment unalterable, but now we've got the Bible or, or this collection that can't be added to or deleted from. And, 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 and then what that does is it really, as I said earlier, binds people to a specific set of, iron, of in this case, um, Iron Age understandings of the world around us and goodness. And, and, and God, if, if, if that is kind of how you describe the ultimate reality and the ultimate goodness. Um, I get excited about the internet, um, in part because I think one of the things that it does is it puts the conversation back in motion so that you have in the best of the written word, right, which is what the written word lets you do, is it lets you take ideas, assemble them slowly, think about them in a deep way, and then transmit them to people who have no physical contact with each other and who don't have the capacity to retain an oral tradition, which I certainly don't have. Um, and at the same time, it's fluid, it's always changing, and there's a whole generation of people who recognize, like if, you know, who recognize that. Like you go to Wikipedia, and the article may not be the same from one day to, to, to the next. In fact, a static body of text is, is considered a weakness, right? They say a book is out of date the minute that it's in print, and we have now developed a communications technology that transcends that. So I, I think that that both, to me, again, is a reminder of why the Bible can't be the word of God. It's so finite, so, it's so finite that it's obsolete <laughs> um, from a technology standpoint. And, um, and it also gives me hope that we are able to really put the conversation, the big conversation, back in motion. All right, so, um, so I'm going to be a little bit contrary, and also I, um, I, 
I might find myself unexpectedly or in ways that I hadn't, hadn't quite imagined agreeing thoroughly with, um, with um, Valerie's point of view while offering a contrast to it. So I also, I grew up in a family in which the Word of God, the Bible, that is literally the King James Version of the Bible, um, a precise, uh, a precise de designation of a specific translation of the Bible that was made in about, what, 1602 or something like that? 1611. And um, all of the rhythms, uh, all of the rhythms of, of my speech, all of the rhythms of my childhood hood were couched in the language of the King James Version of the Bible. Uh, to the extent that, se that 20 some years ago when I first came to Seattle and I went to the University of Washington for a couple of years, I took the first ever Shakespeare class I had ever taken. And on the first day of class, we were assigned to read one of Shakespeare's plays and I took it home and I didn't understand anything that I was reading. The language was, it, it seemed like a foreign language to me. And, and then on the second day of class, the professor just happened to mention that Shakespeare wrote most of his plays around the same time that the King James Version of the Bible was translated, and I went home and I could read every single word of every Shakespeare play, and I knew what the language was. It was, it was as though there was this shift at a cellular level for me that just transformed my ability to understand Shakespeare. So I grew up in a world in which not only the language was precise, but it was dependab dependably accurate in the most scientific um, in the most scientific way. Every single word of the Bible was directly dictated specifically by God in order to communicate directly and completely with the human beings who are on, who are on this planet. So I also grew up in a world in which the Bible was viewed as essentially as a scientific text. That is when, when, uh, um, when who's the guy who stood on the hill and God stopped the, the earth from moving for about a, oh, Joshua. Joshua, Joshua stood on the hill and, and uh, in the middle of the battle, God wanted to give more time for the Israelites to beat their opponents. And so God said, all right, hold up your, your hand with, I can't remember the story now. I read it about a billion times. So what was it? <laughs> he stops the sun, he stops he the sun in its motion. That was literally true. It was a scientific observation, and it, and it was recorded in the Bible, and we were expected to accept and believe every single word of it. And, and they did that so they could slaughter the enemy. Exactly, so that they could slaughter the enemy. So here's what's interesting. We all, actually, all of us grew up in a world in which the word belief has been given within the past couple of hundred years, really, only in relatively modern times, a very specific meaning that it never had before. The word belief today essentially means agreement or congruence with a certain stated set of factual declarations. It mean, if I believe something, it means uh, somebody out there says, here's some stuff, here's some objective observations, or here's a set of, of conclusive of, of, of conclusions you can draw about the state of the universe or the nature of reality or about what human beings are or who we are or what we do. And if you agree with these beliefs, then you are orthodox. And if you agree with those other beliefs, then you are not orthodox or you believe in some other system of thought. But there's, we're still talking about beliefs here. But in the Bible, the translation of the Bible, as a matter of fact, the word belief came from, from a, a root of the Greek word pistis, P-I-S-T-I-S, -I -I and it did not mean intellectual or agreement with a set of intellectual assertions. It instead meant faith. And by faith, what it meant was essentially, what is it that fundamentally deeply motivates your life? What is it that absolutely is at the center of who you are? What is it that drives your behavior? and your, rela your relationships, what is it that moves your passions in the deepest possible way? It's interesting to me also that the first recorded instance in the history of the world when the word atheist was used, it was in, a, in, in the second century AD. It was used in the context of the Roman Empire 
and it was used only and explicitly to define and describe Christians. The reason is that for the first time, somebody in the Roman Empire was willing to say, I literally, I do not believe that Caesar is the son of God, the savior of the world. The gospel is the good news of Roman law spread through the provinces. That Caesar himself will be, will be resurrected and will live again. He is the son of God, very literally. All of the language that we know of today as being the language of Christianity was originally the language of the Roman Empire in describing Caesar. And the ironic, the, the ironic uh, substitution of Jesus for Caesar was a crime against the state. Atheists were people who said, your version of God, I think, is bullshit. There's a different way to understand what God is. And people died for that belief. In some sense, um, I'm not at all sure that Valerie, for example, in calling herself an atheist would agree with me, but my guess is that Valerie's brand of atheism is far, far closer to the original definition of an atheist as someone who has a completely different understanding of what divinity or spirituality is all about than the, than the prevailing culture was willing to admit. And far closer to what Jesus proclaimed as the word of God than many, many generations of so-called Christians since then. So my answer to the question, what is the word of God, or is the Bible of the, wor the word of God, my answer is actually yes and no. Yes and no. Yes in the sense that there is something unnameable, something mysterious, something beyond human comprehension, something way outside our ability to grasp and describe and analyze, and it's something that, that for want of a better word, we call, many of us call, God. When I think about God, I don't think actually about, you know, the, the notion that I had with, of God when I was growing up is this old white guy sitting in the sky on a golden throne in the middle of a of a city with 12 gates, with golden streets and pearly, pearly walls, um, sitting on a throne from which, under which, th uh, from under which flowed the, the river of life. And God, with his great big white beard and his big white robe and his gleaming eyeballs, um, essentially told all the rest of us, you're going to hell, you're going to heaven, you're going to hell, you're going to heaven. I think that's baloney. Complete and utter baloney. It's a projection of our need to have a father tell us what to do and who we are. But I do believe that there is something that I could call God that is all about the realization of the human imagination, the set of relationships, a multitude of relationships that we have each with the other and with every other single living creature in the universe. And that relationship I would call God, or I would call love, or I would call delight, or I would call possibility. I don't, you know, I could use all kinds of different words in the, in the sense that I understand God. By the fundamentalist w that I grew up among, I might be termed a uh, an atheist, but I think it's something much bigger and much deeper than that, actually. So when I think about the word of God, I think, well, yes, actually, the Bible was the word of God. And so is that folding chair right there. So is that light bulb up there. So are you. So am I. So is the river that flows, the Duwamish that flows into Elliott Bay with all of the pustulence and all of the pollution that it carries with it. In, in fact, I would say that every emanation of the physical world and every way in which that physical world is related to an unphysical world or an in, unseen, invisible world, all of this, all of us are in fact the word of God. And when we notice what is the word of God, truly, when we have this, 
gargantuan universal understanding of the word of God, we're somewhat closer to noticing what justice is all about and where love came from and how am I related to you. And all of this is expressed in a phrase that you'll find in the Hebrew Bible and in the New Testament. And it's called the golden rule. It's a common assertion of every significant spiritual tradition on earth that the essence, the essence of what, it, what makes us worth, worth caring about, any of us, is that we know how to, at a cellular, at an, an essentially genetic level, we know that it's important to care for your neighbor as, as yourself, to love your neighbor as yourself. Actually, the, the, whole, the whole thing is love, you know, Jesus in, in his expression of the two fundamental commandments said, there are two commandments that matter. One is love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and the other is love your neighbor as yourself. There are actually three commandments embedded in that statement. One is love God, whatever that is. The depth of that, of that statement is something that I can't express. Secondly, love your neighbor. I can get that a little bit more. Then love yourself. Uh, fundamentally, I mean, that for me is the hardest of the three commandments. But it, in some ways, is the foundation of all of them. Because if you don't, under, if you don't have the, capac the capacity to look deep into yourself and to notice the spark of divinity that is within you, you can't recognize the spark of divinity that's in the Duwamish River or in your neighbor whom you meet on the street downtown or in the park next door. So I believe in the word of God. <laughs>